two, one. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Indiethon. We are live, coming at you from the internet on Twitch. I am your host, Boo, for the final stretch of this marathon. I have with me currently the amazing Hippon Wanna with Love 3. So I'm really looking forward to looking to seeing this game in action. So please take it away. All right, hey everyone, I'm Heppin Wana. Uh, you probably seen me at various speedrun events before. I was here at IndieThon for the spring event just a few months ago. I'm all over the place. I do a lot of real cool indie games primarily. Um, a lot of games that I think just are really cool, bring about a good vibe. We're going to be playing Love 3. Love 3 is a precision platformer where we play a little guy called 5'8". He's called that because he's five of his pixels wide, eight of them tall. He's that little dude on the left hand side of the screen right now. Little stick figure. Also, I always like to make sure this game has a great ability to include style. Who doesn't like style? I like to make sure I've got my uh, flag up, you get a bunch of different choices. I go with this one because trans rights are human rights. And I like to have that little bit of the style right there. You could play with a hat or without. I'm going without a hat. But in this game, we're going to go through a bunch of stages. Uh, Love 3 is the third in a trilogy of games, and there are a lot of stages to play. There are the Love 1 stages, there are the remastered Love 1 stages, Love 2 Kuso, Love 3 came with its own stages. So since no bid war was decided on this, um, there was a mental coin flip that was tossed, and we're going with classic, so we're going to be playing the original 2014 version of Love. We're going to be playing through all of Love 2 Kuso and all of Love 3. That is a total of, I want to say, 67 stages. It's 66 with a bonus stage because of how the game is designed. I'll get into that when we go. So we're going to go through this. Um, time will start when I pretty much count down so get ready on that I'll explain about the game as we go through and we'll just have some fun from there so time begins in three two one go all right so that is me dying right away that is not intended so every stage has three uh, colors to it there is black that is the void that is what you run through um, there is white White is stuff that does stuff, be it you, be it um, bouncy pads, spikes that'll kill you. And then there is a single color for every stage. That was a collectible, by the way. We're doing 100%, so we gotta get a collectible in every single stage. So we're going to get these bounce pads. Another element of every stage is a different song. And the soundtrack to this game is a banger. I just love it, unfortunately, ooh as a accidental death, much like I want to be the guy, this game is all about super precision platforming. Unlike I want to be the guy, it is all about no RNG and nothing that's unfair. If you die, you know whose fault it is when I die? Mine, because everything is set. It is very, um, uh, very, uh, what am I trying to say? Um, it is very much based on uh, just stable, uh, my mind blanked on that term, but it is all about going through and just having a very fair experience, but a very hard one. So like right here, all these white things will kill you. Uh, so we want to move very fast while not touching them. Another, this is one of the hardest ones for me to keep a good rhythm on classic. So the classic, versus remastered. I should get into that real quick. My mouth is running as fast as 5.8, by the way. Uh, that's kind of how I do things. My mouth just keeps running. Right now we're in a slow tube. So classic versus remastered. The remastered stages you might call the 
the director's cut. They're a lot more refined, a lot nicer. We got a hidden secret here because the cake is not a lie. So the difference between those 16 stages of classic versus remastered is which ones kind of flow better and feel better. It doesn't mean that classic is not good. It just means that remastered kind of has a little more style to it. But sometimes there is quality to, you know, kind of something a little rougher, a little more, you know, down to earth. So the story of this game, we should probably also talk about the story. So we are playing 5-8. I already explained why he is called 5-8. He is in a post-apocalyptic nightmare of a world, much like our own. Kidding. No, our world's pretty good. Uh, and we could keep making it better by donating to great causes like the Samaritans. By the way, donate. Um, but 5-8 is on a quest to do what any of us would do in a post-apocalyptic world where he's on his own. He is looking for a friend. He wants to find people. We're going to clip through that block, speedrun strat right there. So now we gotta wait for these bouncy pads. And this is very important to kind of mentally add things up. A oh, one, two, one, two, three four bounce bounce so we want to kind of mentally count there so we don't accidentally bop ourselves we will die a lot in this game this game is all about dying but it's also all about living one cool thing is when you're playing on speedrun mode there is no rng and everything is um based around you having infinite lives so i did not mean to I did not mention controls. I forgot to do that as well. So controls, you might notice I'm putting down these checkpoints behind me. You are free to put a checkpoint wherever you want in this game. It's one of the charms of this game is putting down these checkpoints wherever you want to. But you have to remember, you cannot put a checkpoint where you cannot stand. So you cannot put one on a bouncy pad because you can't stand on a bouncy pad. You gotta keep moving on them. Ooh, that was unfortunate. Uh, you also cannot put a checkpoint down on a, a hazard. So if something would kill you, you cannot put a checkpoint there. Right now we're at the worst type of stage for speedrunning. This is the one true auto-scroller in this game. Um, you'll notice that front bouncy platform. We can never outrun that one. We need it. So I'm going to take a second and hydrate. And so, what I was saying about putting down checkpoints, we could put down as many checkpoints as we want. No harm to it. However, if you put a checkpoint where you could not survive, or let's say an obstacle comes in and kill would kill you, it will kill the checkpoint. And what that means is if I die and my checkpoint dies, if I die, I'm going back to the very start of the stage. And that is bad news for everyone concerned. So we're just doing a few little extra deaths here because we're still waiting. As I miss aim, there we go. So we want to collect all of those collectibles. The collectibles are important for that 100%. And you might notice the collectibles, for the most part, are pretty obvious. You're probably like, those collectibles are so obvious, what is even the point of them? They're, some of them are almost in the way. We hit the, we're in the belly of the beast or the mouth of it. We hit the tonsils and that opened up a new route. And so, as we go through collecting all of these collectibles that seem super obvious, we're going to start finding some that are quite out of the way. This here is a tricky little jump. Um, so we need to get all of the collectibles and once we get into the later stages they're going to start becoming a lot less a lot less obvious boy i am i am adding extra deaths just just for the joy of it i think but some of the collectibles will start getting a little trickier and as we go go along they're going to get trickier and trickier i'm gonna this here is actually very 
height jumping. It's one of the big differences. With the remastered stages, they are a lot more generous on the difficulty of these jumps. So that collectible was very well hidden. Um, this stage, in terms of remastered versus classic, this is the one stage I, sh I feel truly shows the difference and is without a doubt my least favorite of the classic stages because we are going to lose a lot of time on the collectible. So, the collectible here, we put a checkpoint back there and we got to go all the way back to it because we had to fall down that pit and either we kill ourselves and go back to the checkpoint or we don't and ooh, that was not a smart move by me. Either we kill ourselves, go back to the checkpoint, or we had to go through a lot of the stage again. This game does have uh, YOLO medals for every stage, so Fred Wood, the developer, put in a kind of bonus incentive of can you get through every stage without dying? Fred Wood also is a speedrunner of Super Mario 64 and a huge fan of the speedrun community and actually runs the Discord for the speedrunning of this game. Really cool guy with, you know, a lot of support for the community. Anytime there's an update, he makes sure that it's not going to be saying that breaks speedrunning. He's actually left bugs in the game that have kind of annoyed him as a developer because he wanted to make sure that we kept all of the speedrun uh, strats from one version to another. We want to bop that right through that white obstacle. It would have killed us to touch that white obstacle, but by bopping the platform through it, we had a platform to ride on. This stage here, all about teleporters, because teleporters are pretty cool. No, not when you get killed going through them. I took a moment there to pick the right one jump through because it would have put me in one of three places. We are almost done with love. After love, of course, is going to come Kuso, but first, this stage did not exist in the original release of love. The reason it's here is you'll notice every time we finish a stage, if we're running right, we enter the next stage on the left side running to the right. The problem is the original final stage of love exited to the left, but you started uh, Kuso stage one, this one, on the left running to the right, and that would have broken the ability to smoothly speed run the game. So we are now in Kuso. Kuso, a lot like love, but ooh, a little bit more refined in my opinion. And we also get to see Charlie the cat five times. So Fred Wood put his cat Charlie, which is really cool. I mean, I love pets. I've got a Corgi. And if I made games, I would put that Corgi in the game. You better believe I would. No All right. cute. And what's great is Fred Wood included Charlie's meow digitized and reduced to a MIDI sample, which is pretty cool if you ask anyone. <laughs> I was going to say if you ask me, but you don't need to ask me. It's pretty cool to anyone. Ooh. So here we want to be very careful. We're going to see Charlie again on this stage. So we're going to go up and this is one of the first truly like beyond hidden collectibles. And once we get out of Love 2 and get into Love 3, the collectibles are going to become even more hidden. Like we're actually going to have to, in Love 3, solve puzzles for them. So we're not just going to have a speedrun precision platformer, we're going to have a obscure, there's Charlie, obscure puzzle solving game. Which is going to get real cool when we see it. And I'll just say, when the game came out, all of us who were, uh, you know, speedrun community for this game. It's somewhat small, but very, you know, very tight knit. And we were all excited to try and solve how do we find these collectibles. But for right now, we're still in Love 2 Kuso, which this is actually the first game I speedran and submitted to events. The first one I actually submitted runs to SRC. So love to these stages hold a special place in my heart because of how 
it really opened things up for me. If you're watching this and you're not a speedrunner, consider speedrunning. It is a lot of fun. It really brings a lot of a lot of good vibes. Like you find a community like the Love 2 community, the Love 3 community. Here we're that's what killing a checkpoint looks like, by the way. Oh, I missed my timing window on that slightly. But if you've ever thought about speedrunning, give it a shot. It is really fun. It really can bring about some good vibes. I'm kind of an introvert at heart and it helped bring out like help bring me out of my shell. So I owe this game, these levels so much for just kind of, you know, opening up my eyes to, you know, some fun I could be having. By the way, dying repeatedly, not the fun that I am looking for, but it's a part of the the beast we are facing here. Easiest collectible in the game, because it's actually easier to grab that collectible than take the intended route of taking each of those platforms. Here we have guns shooting at us. They will train on us, and they can be real tricky if we fall slightly off on our cycle with them. Cycle, by the way, was a word I was trying to think of earlier when I said the game's really fair and something based. I could not remember. I meant to say it's cycle based. And by that I mean there is an optimal cycle for pretty much everything. Ooh, I got greedy there. I should have probably gone a little less on that greedy side, but it's all good. But this game is very cycle based. Some stages, um, it's easy enough to get back on cycle if you fall off some are really tricky to get back on cycle so we'll see some of the challenges of that as we go along this stage if you're going for any percent you could literally go through this whole stage if you know the route and i did not want to fall down here i accidentally missed a jump but if you uh, know the routes you actually can just kind of fall through this stage really fast if you don't know the routes it's super slow meanwhile if you're going for a hundred percent to get that collectible you really have to take a bad route you have to take some time and if you make some bad jumps like i did you had to take a little extra time another fun thing on this game is if you play it um for speed running uh, on Steam, the leaderboards are really accurate. This game, we use in-game timer for it because um, the in-game timer is based off of frames and this game runs at a good 60 frames per second. Um, you move at a rate of one frame per, or one pixel per frame horizontally. I did not mean to put a checkpoint right there and that was very poor move. I meant to leave my checkpoint because we've got to go all the way. So, a nerve button I did not mean to use uh, normally, but had to use it there, is you can actually reset all your checkpoints and go back to the very start of a stage because I accidentally put my checkpoint in a place I could not get back from. But that was Charlie again. Charlie, we've got another, I forget if it's one or two Charlie encounters. Actually, it's two Charlie encounters are left ahead of us. And we will, I will definitely call those out because Charlie is best kitty, at least in this game. There's in, uh, in Love 3, there is another pair of, actually a pair of cat and dog. I missed that jump. So this game, if you're wondering, what's the difference between Love 2 and Love 3? Considering Love 2 has all the stages of Love 1. By the way, we're going to try a single cycle perfect movement. Oh, the stage, if I fall off cycle, it becomes very hard for me to get back on cycle. So we'll see if I could do it. But all right there we go that is what we meant to do the first time uh if you move perfectly 
you can hit that on a perfect cycle. I accidentally fell a couple uh, couple pixels off of where I wanted to be. The whole joy of speedrun marathon is you always get those marathon nerves. No matter how comfortable you are with a game, you always get the the slight jitteriness because you know you get excited and at the same time you always want to do a good job making the game look good. Here is another Charlie. We'll get playful Charlie right there. Best kitty. So in the web three stages we're actually possibly going to see Milo and Bork, which is a cat and dog pair because unfortunately Charlie is no longer with us, but Fred Wood does have Milo and Bork. By the way, these little hover pods that look kind of cool, it's like little dudes in like weird vehicles. We are actually going to see those come back in Love 3. And we are going to actually steal one of those hover pods. So let's do this nice and good. This stage is one where at a marathon, I always have a bad habit of getting way, way too nervous for my own good and making a few little mistakes, but not too bad overall. A little jumping right here. And this stage, we're going to have the joy of bullets that move in a weird up and down pattern. It's going to make a big mess for us. The secret, you hopefully saw it as we went up that upward platform or upward shaft, elevator shaft, whatever you call that. You could get through two of these at a time as long as you go at a perfect cycle. You want, you have a maybe about two frames on that to go through. There is a, that is nearly a frame perfect drop. It might actually be frame perfect. I never really checked on the exact stats of it. But you're meant to wait a cycle on falling down. This next stage is Wizard is the name of the stage. And we are going to try some, ooh, I messed it up. We were going to try and do something known as perfect wizard skip. We should have been ahead of this cycle. So on the sides, you'll notice there are safety platforms on the left and right. We're meant to use those, but nearly frame perfect, we could go up that with really good jumps. Final Charlie right there. Unfortunately, we've got to say goodbye to Charlie now because we are on stage 23 of Love 2, which means we are pretty much done with uh, the Charlie secrets on Love 2. By the way, throw down a checkpoint, sacrifice it, watch it die. That's what happens. And now we are gonna do a little good maneuvering right through there. Uh, jump a little frantically. Don't know what I was doing there. I felt like I could go, I couldn't go, I ah, type of thing. So here we're meant to run back and forth repeatedly so that thing can shoot out the floor and we don't die. Instead, we take a death and we could get through without worry, get through in just one death cycle instead of somewhere around three passes. Three passes is way too much time for us because we've got to get on. We are speed running. So we will now go through and now we're on stage 25 of Kuso. By the way, I think of stage 25 of Kuso and stage 16 of Love 1 and actually stage 25 of Love 3, which also has 25 stages, as the final exam. We're going to see a little bit of everything we saw from the previous 24 stages. There's that gun shooting at us. Hopefully you remember him. Oh, I tried rushing that. Did not quite make it. There's that orange stage with those big motor looking things. There's that. The wizard elevators right here. Unfortunately, did not trust going up there on one cycle, but it's also one cycleable. From stage 23, the platforms that keep disappearing and reappearing at the end of that stage. From that ice blue stage that had the real chill music and Charlie at the end, the rotating thing, pretty much we're able to see all those cool things we saw before and face them all in one, one single go. By the way, I have placed a checkpoint under those 
hammers before and killed, uh, accidentally died, ended up having redo this whole stage. This is the longest stage of Love 2, so that is painful do. This final obstacle is kind of a mess at times, and now we're on Love 3. Love 3, a lot like Love 2, except now all the secrets are going to be convoluted and require puzzle solving. So, spoilers if you ever pick up this game because playing it casually, spoilers are abounding. Got to step there, then there. You'll notice some pixels lit up, and then step there, and that opens up this. This was previously sealed off. I did not mean to do that. I did bad on jumping. So, I was mentioning before, what's the difference between these stage or the previous stage it's on web 2 versus on web 3 web 2 and web 3 have different jump controls uh web 2 has more of a coyote jump if you don't know coyote jumping named after wily coyote you know he would run off of a cliff uh have a couple frames so to speak there we go rolling that over that little spot on the ground we'll open this up and so, Wily Coyote would have a couple frames to hold up the yikes sign. In Love 2, you have a couple frames after you jump off a ledge to be able to um, continue jumping. In Love uh, 3, we don't have Coyote jumping. So, by the way, if you saw this at any recent big events, like uh, there was a race of these stages, the any percent of Love 3, at um, AGDQ this uh, this last January, there were some skips in it, like out of bounds skips. I do not do the out of bounds. I I will do one out of bounds um, that feels kind of more intentional, but I actually don't do out of bounds all that much. So, oops, I don't know why I wasn't jumping there. So you will not see some of those out of bounds skips like that last stage actually had an out of bounds skip that would save you all oh, about four or five seconds. This is really hard by the way. I liken it to Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles on the NES, which is say it's like that seaweed uh, stage. It is very tricky. It is annoying. Uh, getting those two collectibles up above opened up the real collectible, which was on the right-hand side. Now, you might know me from playing games like Below the Ocean. I kind of feel like this game is in that vibe because we went under the ocean and found some water down below it in a moving block. I love the upbeat tempo of this music right here. I'm going to take a minute just to enjoy it. Soundtrack to this game is a complete banger, by the way. Like, every song is so good. Um, this game is made more or less by two people. There is uh, Fred Wood, who developed the game, does programming. And then there is, I forget his first name, but last name is Bennett. And he does the entire soundtrack, every song. So as I jump on certain platforms like that one, you'll notice the pixels change just a little. And that is, oh boy, I fell off cycle and that puts me in the mindset where it's hard to get back on cycle. Oh, now I'm in my own head, but we want to go on all of these, get those pixels to change by way, we want to keep a checkpoint at that one because we're going to go back to it. You hit all of those and it makes those jump pads. All right, this stage right here, I like to call it Dinky King. It's because it is very much like Donkey Kong, but very much not Donkey Kong. It is Dinky King. Those barrels, they move at the same speed as you. We could slightly catch up because we're cutting corners. Put a checkpoint right there. We'll go over here, jump here, and we triggered something. What'd we trigger? Well, who knows for now we will... Oh boy, I put a checkpoint in a bad place, so I had to go out of my way and put that extra checkpoint because if I died, that would have been just bad news for everything. Put a checkpoint right there. 
and upper right you'll see something opened up so we're going one two three one two three do this on a pattern you could get four if you're really good um you need to be like way too precise i made a small boo-boo i meant to put a checkpoint there not to hit the reset button and then we go through here this stage can really be difficult on one's vision to keep track of where everything is moving because there is a lot moving and they all want to pretty much kill you. There are some tricky jump pads. We'll put a checkpoint here because we want to step on those two places and run to that wall under that little spinning, that big spinning uh, pillar of doom. And that put us into a little mini stage where we got our collectible. And now, notice the collectible on the right. What, you don't see it? How about we go back and there it is. It wasn't there until we came back for it. Like I said, this game really makes a challenge on finding those collectibles. All right, that was not the collectible, by the way. That was a key to open up this. And this here is the real collectible. You could tell the collectible because the stage is going to make some noises as machines shut down. We will learn more about those machines later on, but this stage is a good example of the machine shutting down because once we grab the collectible, first we need four keys. You'll notice those lights lighting up right above me right there. We grab the fourth one without dying. It opens this up and there's the machine. It looks like there are our friends in the machine. It looked like five, eight people were in that machine. That's bad news. This is not part of the collectible. This is a key to open the exit of the stage. It's kind of tricky knowing which is which. You'll notice the barrels ended though. There were no more barrels. And that's because we shut down the machine. Since the machine shut down, no more barrels were being made. So this one, it feels to me a lot like I'm in a pinball machine. It is very much in line with, you know, all the bumpers and chaos of a pinball machine. We want checkpoint right there. Gotta wait for that. We want that checkpoint where I put it because there's the first key. The checkpoint was at the second key and then we can hit those and we'll put a checkpoint here. And now we're going back to the start of the stage, hopefully without dying, because we're not putting in our checkpoint because we're going to use that checkpoint we put down to get to the end of the stage. But there is the collectible at the very beginning. And now we could go the ending. There's a lot going on with this. I'll just say any percent is a lot more straightforward, a lot easier to kind of wrap one's head around by way we are not putting any more checkpoints we hit those two switches and we won't go back here because there is more going on when you play any percent it's pretty straightforward just get to the end of a stage when you're playing harm percent it is anything but straightforward but it is a lot of fun by way you might notice Fred Wood's inspirations in this game. There is a lot of old school video games that are kind of called out. Like there are obvious Donkey Kong inspirations or Dinky King inspirations. There's also Mega Man's Yoko bricks, those bricks that fade in and out in Mega Man. So the white bricks here, once you destroy them, they're gone forever. The white bricks also will kill you if you touch them. We don't want to touch them. Those guns will kill us, but we could control those guns. The purple bricks are safe to stand on and they will come back. So we are going to take advantage of that. So why are we destroying every white brick? That feels excessive, doesn't it? Well, the reason for that, I need a sound cue. There it is. We want to hear knock, knock, knock. If we get rid of every white brick, we're going to open up the secret. And we would only find the secret if we get every white brick destroyed, making this kind of a frustrating level until you... I missed one. Oh, I keep missing that one right there. Thank you. 
but it makes it frustrating when you're first trying to route this game because how do you route to get all of these? It feels like a huge time sink and you start learning like how to do it as quick as possible. We heard a beep. That beep is just what we needed. We will take this gun and we will open up this right here. We will move that gun just a fraction because if you don't move a gun for a whole minute, they reset their position. And so getting everything opened up this, if those guns reset their position, this cycle feels bad. There we go. If they reset their positions, you could end up running into them in a bad way. I mentioned those helipods from the uh, Love 2 coming back. We're going to steal a helipod or two or three. We're going to cause chaos with helipods right here. So we're going to take this one, park it. The secret on this one requires touching four spots that are very tricky to get to. I touched two earlier going where those helipods were coming from. That one I just got was another one. And there's the fourth one. Ooh, and I did not mean to bot myself there, but I was trying to rush a cycle. Not Marathon Safe. Marathon Safe is doing that, putting down a checkpoint just like that right there put in our checkpoint so getting those four spots open this up which is some tricky flying and might i add flying this is what i call flappy bird professional it controls as weird as flappy bird but it's on a whole new level from flappy bird so this here is the mini exam you know the midterm we are meant to complete four different quadrants that each has one of those collectible looking symbols and that will unlock a jump pad that is the collectible for the stage by the way it'll unlock a jump pad right to my left that will let us jump out of here instead we are going to steal the car the helipod which is incredibly tricky like i said professional grade flappy bird right here All right, because I messed up so much, there's Milo and Bork. Let's take a moment to appreciate Kitty and Doggy. There we go. That's just a moment out of our way. I wasn't on world record pace or anything, so I thought, why not show that off a little bit? Nice little bonus secret. Secret that doesn't count for 100%, but it should because it's Kitty and Doggy having a good time. So here, we touch there. We will touch there and then a few other spots i should also add saying very important with this game if you ever want to try it and it's on steam it's also on switch and we got a collect or a click right there and a final click right here unlocks down here and that's the collectible if you do play this there is one important technique to know which is there are different jump heights you don't just jump and knowing the height of your jump is is key if you do not know your jump height you will not survive